Good morning. It is so good to be here with you this morning, especially in this Christmas season. And like we learned during the song service, many of us could sing those songs forever. Uh, I know my daughter, who is uh, very particular about that, we're not supposed to sing Christmas songs until after Thanksgiving. But boy, oh boy, when that time comes, it is amazing. And, and uh, so thank you so much for your participation in the song service. That was so good. I'd like to just share a couple things with you this morning. And I hope that in doing so, we might be an encouragement to you. I thank you for the opportunity to come. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, not that it's important, but just to give you a little bit of background as to my biography in a sense. And you know pastors love alliteration. Pastors love alliteration. They work hard on alliterations. I worked hard on this. I grew up in South Jersey. I used to call that, tell my kids that was the promised land. And for some reason, they never bought into that. So anyway, South Jersey, and we'll give that the letter P, that was the Philadelphia area. After growing up there, I went to college in Cedarville, Ohio, at the time Cedarville College, now Cedarville University. And for the sake of alliteration, we'll call that a P, pig farm area. From there, graduation, went to Portland, Oregon for seminary. Western Conservative Baptist Seminary in Portland, Oregon. Uh, when Mount St. Helens blew, we left shortly after, not for the same reason, but anyways. Then the Lord would have us come back east, and we minister for a bit of time in a little town on the eastern side of the state called Percocy, Pennsylvania. And after a short time being associate pastor there, the Lord led us to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and as you've heard, we've had the privilege to be at Middletown Road. Now note, Middletown Road, not middle of the road Baptist, Middletown Road Baptist. And we were there for 36 years. All those P's. Now we must be out of God's will. We graduated about uh, September a year ago and moved to a town called Kanaquanessing. I'm looking for a P, and I can't find that anywhere along the way. The only thing that's uh, kind of quinescing is known for, it's one of the longest place names in Pennsylvania with 15 letters. And I have often remarked, what if Ben Roethlisberger, Benjamin Todd Roethlisberger, moved to Conoquinessing? He'd be all day writing out his letters or envelopes or whatever you... Uh, do that way. But it's a joy to be here. This is probably my second time we were here for a week of uh, Bible Institute years ago, meeting downstairs in one of the classrooms. And I, I, I think it's a privilege to be here today. And what a beautiful facility. My goodness, look how the Lord has blessed you that way. I remember being here for the Bible Institute, sneaking upstairs just to see what the sanctuary, a pastor does that, seeing what the sanctuary looked like. And this is a tremendous looking sanctuary. And likewise, where the Lord placed you here in the area of city of Washington, uh, I think that is all of the Lord. And I'm praying that you might continue to have a steadfast testimony in this community. We need to pray. I'm sure you're doing that as you look for a pastor. I was compelled to look at Matthew chapter 9 just recently and was reminded that as Jesus looked upon the multitudes, he took compassion on them because they were as sheep scattered without a having a shepherd. You folks need a shepherd. Amen? Oh, I don't know if that was loud enough. Amen? I hope that you're praying to that end. This morning, I'd like to encourage you this way. What are you giving to Jesus for Christmas? I mean, think of it like this. We had Cyber Friday, or Black Friday, I'm sorry. We had Small Town Saturday. We had Cyber Monday. We had Giving Tuesday. Nowhere in there do I hear or did I respond to anything about what are we giving to the Lord? It seems like all those days, by and large, are 
what can I get for myself or what can I get for myself to give to others for Christmas? I mean, it's his birthday, amen? I mean, when you are invited to a birthday celebration, I mean, it's easy nowadays, all you do is buy a gift card. But, you know, it used to be a time that we used to think as to what to give that person, and we kind of uh, wrestled over that, and here it's the Lord's birthday, and I'm wondering, have you decided what you're giving to the Lord Jesus Christ? With that in mind, and a probing question, I hope, take your Bibles and join with me in Revelation chapter 5. I love the... I love the uh, book of Revelation. I love the study of chapter 2s and 3, the letters to the seven churches. I love chapter 4 and 5 when we get a glimpse into heaven. Chapter 4 of Revelation is rem- uh, reminds me of Isaiah chapter 6. That vision of heaven continues into Revelation chapter 5. Note with me, following your word as we look at this, John writes, as he's led by the Spirit of God, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. John continues, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And John says in response, And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. Continuing in verse 6, John writes, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and of the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came, the lamb, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the twenty and four elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And together, verse 9, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book. To open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. John continues, and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And the beast and the, and the elders and the number of them were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Note all of them together. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing of them saying that verse 13 and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever as we come to the end of the chapter, and the four beasts said, Amen! And the four and, 20, uh, four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. With that scene fresh upon our minds, let's bow before the Lord. Heavenly Father, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you were 
sent your son, born to die, that man might live. And as your son came to earth, behold the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And Father, for these next few moments, I pray that you would lay upon our hearts what to give back to the one's birthday that we are celebrating in Christmas. And I pray, Father, that you would just touch our hearts, burden us, that we allow this one day of the year be truly in our hearts, in our lives, the birthday of the King. Thank you for this church. Father, I'm thankful for the community testimony that it's had for many years. And I thank you, Father, for the faithfulness of God's people here and the servants that have worked through the course of this ministry. And Father, I pray today, as the Lord took compassion upon the sheep that were scattered because they had no shepherd, I pray that together this church family would not let you go until by blessing you give them a shepherd to lead this flock. Thank you again, Father, for this time. And Father, I would be remiss if I did not pray as you have commanded in your word for those in authority over us. Father, we are a country adrift. We are a country that again this week turned our back against God and has since spit into the face of God with a marriage act that was approved or continued to be worked on there in Washington. Father, I pray that as Christians live in this culture that you would allow us to be steadfast, uncompromising for what the Word of God says. Thank you again for our time. Father, we do have the privilege and opportunity to worship yet. And I pray that you would continue to provide those as many days of opportunity before us to worship you. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. It is a Christmas story. As I just mentioned previously, it is a Christmas story that I really love and we look forward to each time of the year. It is the Christmas story that we pass down to others. And unfortunately, in recent years, we've even tampered with canceling Christmas. I mean, through the COVID situation, I know we were trying to find our way through as to how to honor God, how to at least as well be obedient to government, and I heard for the first time, I know with great regret, our church, for example, canceled Easter services. Can you believe that? And again, we were all trying to find our way, and this was unknown territory for us, but we should have held a position that we ought to obey God rather than man. The Bible tells us that we ought not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But that on one hand, we live in a culture that is canceling Christmas. I just read just yesterday of a library somewhere in America, and I'm sure that's amplified many times over, of no longer having a Christmas tree in the library's foyer because that's not fair to all the other religions. Some of you have been in the public school system or had children where we can't even sing those Christmas carols anymore, but we can sing Jolly Old St. Nicholas. Are you serious? Where are we going as a culture? I used to say to my family, I love going to the malls at Christmas time, for at least there you might be able to hear some Christmas carols. I'm not even sure about that anymore. Christmas where we talk about Jesus being born of a virgin. And how many times have we gone through the book of Isaiah to be reminded that he was going to be born of the virgin? Christmas, when he would be born a son, for unto us a son is given us, unto us a child is born. Christmas where we understand that Jesus was born to preach in the words of Isaiah chapter 61, bearing tidings of great joy. Christmas, where we understood as we just prayed, can you think about that for a moment? 
born to die, as the hymn writer says, that you and I, man, might live. Christmas, where we as well understood that Jesus was born to rise again. I was with my, my grandchildren just yesterday, and I have a 12-year-old grandson, Judah. His dad's a pastor. I go to his dad's church. That's our church now. And Judah says, Dad, why did you last Christmas talk about Easter? He was born that he might rise again. That's what Christmas is all about. Christmas, where we understand, according to Isaiah chapter 11 and many other passages, he was born, but not only to rise again, but born to rule again. And you and I need to plead and pray together. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And I pray that at Christmas time, he is ruling in our hearts and lives. I'd like to as well remind you that as we look at the text in front of us, this is where I want to encourage you as far as what Christmas is all about and what we ought to consider giving to the Lord Jesus Christ at Christmas. In Revelation chapter 5, as we just read through that passage, note again there was a, there, there was a problem in verse 1 of a seal, a closed seal, a sealed book. The text, as we just read, continues. In verse 2, there was a strong angel who stood aloud with a loud voice to say, Who is worthy? The word worthy is in both chapter 4 and 5. The word problem of who is worthy to open up the book. As we read through the chapter, there was a sad state in verses 3 and 4. No one was worthy. In fact, it says that John was crying because no one could be found to open up the book. Then we see in chapter in verses 5 through 7, there was one that was worthy. Note there, there was one that was worthy that approached the throne. Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Then as we fin finish the book, because he was worthy to open up the book to break the seals, out of that there was a stupendous worship in verses 4 through 18, uh, four, I'm sorry, verse 8 through 14. And the whole of heavens would celebrate Note the celebration, verse 9. Thou art worthy to take the book. Later on, verse 12. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Now note, he was the only one worthy. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the culmination of Christmas. Thou art worthy. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor, and glory, and blessing. Those is what I would propose to you in the words of verse 12. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Those are the gifts that I would suggest to you that we must give to Jesus for Christmas. First, in order to understand all those that we see in verse 12, we need to understand that word worthy. I love that word worthy. We saw that word at least four times in these two chapters, Revelation 4 and 5. Worthy, meaning that he uh, and he alone is worthy for whatever we give to him. And as I thought about the word worthy, I was reminded of Paul's words in, Revelation, in Romans chapter 12. Listen to this. Paul, coming to that point in Romans where you apply all those great doctrines he just discussed prior to that, would say this to the Roman Christians. I beseech you therefore, brethren. That word beseech is a strong word of begging. I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, and that, as we understand, God, 
the lamb who was slain, as we read about in Revelation 5, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Paul says, which is your reasonable service? What are you saying? In light of what he has done for you, this is what you're expected to give back to him, your reasonable service. And he pleads as a result, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This morning I ask of you, are you given at least your body as a living sacrifice only in light of what he's already done for you? He's redeemed you. He's purchased your salvation. What are you giving back to him? I'm reminded as I think of that verse out of Romans chapter 12, that all throughout the scriptures, dear Christian, it is commanded of us that thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, other places, with all your being. This Christmas time, do you love the Lord your God with all that you are, with the essence of yourself. Let's just explore that. Again, Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. Thou art worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive first and foremost power. The word there for power is the word for authority. The word for authority you saw or you are reminded or we know has been many places in Scripture But among them, Matthew chapter 28, and Jesus came and spake unto the disciples. This is after his death, burial, and resurrection. He appears to his disciples in the closing book of Matthew, Matthew chapter, it says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me. Or in some translations, all authority is given unto me. You know what the Lord is telling his disciples? I'm in charge here. I'm in control here. Is the Lord the authority, the power of your life? Is he in control? That is so important for us as believers to wrestle with. Who is in control here? Ephesians says it this way. Paul's great prayer from Ephesians chapter 1. Listen what he prays for that church. That you may know, Paul says as he prays, what is exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe. According to the working of his mighty power, how great was that power? Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. That power continues so powerful that it's far above all principalities, all powers, all might, every dominion, and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. May I remind you, Hebrews says it this way, as far as the Lord's power. He hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. He is in control, or at least he should be. Which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Later on, who being in the brightness of his power, glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he by himself purged their sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. All authority belongs unto him. Is he the power of your life? Proverbs remind us he ought to be the power over my future. My dad's favorite verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart 
and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. What that says is allow him to be in control. All power belongs to him. And then the promise, and he shall direct thy paths. So over my future, is he in control? How about over me now? Paul says in the book of Romans, Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul pleads as far as that power, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as members or instruments of unrighteousness, but yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Then he concludes that in Romans 6, For sin shall not have dominion or power over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Many years ago I did a dumb thing. It wasn't the only time I did dumb things, but in this particular case I saw a cup I needed. I used to collect mugs until they overtook our kitchen and my wife said no more. But I saw a mug that I just had to have. And I bought it. Emblazoned on its side was boss. My mistake was I took it to church. I'm not the boss of the church. The Lord Jesus Christ is boss. Amen. He is Lord. He is risen from the grave. And he is Lord. This Christmas time, why not give him your power? Why not allow him to be in control, completely so, of your lives? Revelation 5, 12 continues. It says the word riches. If I could just uh, superimpose over riches, resources, riches. Psalmist reminds us who resources or riches belongs to. It says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. We belong, this earth belongs to him. So, as far as riches, always a dangerous thing to talk about in church. What about your giving? Remember I said Black Friday, Small Town Saturday, Cyber Monday, Giving Tuesday, where in all of that are we giving of our resources to the Lord? Sad thing, many times about Christmas, I'm paying well into the new year to pay off my Christmas debts with little thought as to what I should be given to the Lord. The Bible reminds us concerning my money now, as Christians, we kind of had this mindset that I gave my tithe. Did you know that Christians, it's not commanded to give a tithe? It is commanded, though, as we consider God's blessing, to give the best of what we have back to him. It says, so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. So all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And come and follow me. You know the story, but when he heard this, he became very sorrowful. For he was very rich. And Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful. He said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven or God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What about your riches? As a pastor many times... I pleaded with our folks to make sure they gave lovingly as unto the Lord, to make sure that they gave without being grudge or, uh, you mean I got to give my money again this week? Without grudgingly to the Lord. It all belongs to Him. Amen? It's His. God gave you those resources. God gave you the brain to get those resources. Why not give back to him? But we're talking about riches. There's another thing that I believe t Christians have failed to give back to the Lord, and that is of our time. 
Consider what Paul says. He says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. There's a new word now concerning television viewing. And they call it binge viewing. I can sit down and watch a whole series of things, and before you know it, my time spent in front of the TV contrasted to my time spent walking with the Lord. Redeeming the time. Paul says, because the days are evil. Are we not, dear believer, living in evil days? Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, walk in wisdom to them that without out. He says as well, redeeming the time. God's resources to me is money. God's resources to me is time. But you know what? God has also resourced each and every believer with spiritual gifts. What's your involvement in the local church? Now, I'm not talking about natural abilities. I'm talking about God-given spiritual abilities that he's bestowed upon each and every believer when we come to know the Lord. And those God-given spiritual abilities are to, meant to be practiced within the local church. They say 20% of the work, I'm sorry, uh, how does that go? Uh, 20% of the work in the church, of all the work done in the church, excuse me, 20% of it is done by those people where 80% do nothing. Are you a pew sitter? You're here, you do your time and then leave? Or do you come to church to work somehow? Lord, use me in the ministry that you've called me to. Riches. Time, tithe, or money, and spiritual gifts. But we continue in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. Worthy is the Lamb not only to receive power and riches and wisdom. My wisdom ought to come from on high. Amen? Oh, that was weak. Amen? Proverbs chapter 1. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 1 Corinthians, Paul says, understand this, not many wise in the world are chosen. But he does say, those that are chosen, we need to make sure that we walk in the wisdom of God. James chapter 1, verse 5. I'm thankful for this verse. If any man of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally. And I like this part. And the bread of thought, and it shall be given him. Giving wisdom back to the Lord is simply relying upon the Lord for wisdom. How do you do that? Spending time in his word. How do you do that? Spending time in prayer. I pray that this Christmas time, your wisdom will come from on high. Revelation 5, 12 continues. It says not only wisdom, but as well strength. Our strength ought to come from him. The Lord Jesus said to his disciples just moments before the crucifixion, he pleads with them, abide in me and I in you. That strength as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But listen to this now, for without me you can do nothing. Strength. Paul says as far as strength, I can do all things through Christ. Christ, which strengtheneth me. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2, that he would grant you, according, uh, elsewhere, I'm sorry, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. 
strength. Where does your strength come from today? Every day I need to rely upon the Lord step by step for his strength. Then uh, Revelation chapter 5, give unto the Lord, worthy is the Lamb. We come upon the word honor. Honor. Basically, the word honor means ascribing to someone else great privilege. In other words, the Lord says it this way. This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. You know, he is Lord. Yeah, he's Lord. But the Lord continues, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me. I pray that we honor the Lord. Elsewhere we're reminded, a new heart will I give unto you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh that I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. That's giving the Lord honor. Colossians says it this way, echoed several times now throughout the New Testament. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. This Christmas time, let's honor him. Let's make sure that he receives from us what he's worthy of. A good thing of honor, or good example of honor, is making sure whatever you do, that he did it. Let me give you a slight illustration, and I'm not saying it to, to toot my horn because I have nothing to toot with or about, but every once in a while, as our kids were growing up in the home, people would say to me, my, your kids are well-behaved. Well, I knew better, but anyways... And then they would say along the way, my, have they grown and have they developed? And I know that my children's parents were sinners. And I know that as sinners, we had very little, but to God be the glory, what he did in and through the life of my children. That's giving the Lord honor. We continue, Revelation 5, verse 12, glory is the next John chapter 7 says, He that speaketh of himself seeks his own glory. Have you ever noticed that in the church, especially in the church, that we always play one-upmanship in our conversation? I remember hearing a comedy routine from somebody who said, I wish I went up to the moon. Then I could go to these parties and say, well, you think that's bad. I walked on the moon. I mean, how can you up that? But we in the church, we're constantly, well, you think that's bad, I, and then. And Paul says of our speech, we're to build one another up, not to trumpet what we've done, to encourage one another. But it says here, he that speaketh, John 7, speaks of himself, seeks his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory, that sent him, the same is true, and there's no unrighteousness in him. It says in 2 Corinthians, He that glories, let him glory in the Lord. For not that he commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Paul says in Galatians likewise, But God forbid that I should glory. Paul knew it was nothing that he did. Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Revelation 5, verse 20, worthy is the lamb. Another thing that we give back to the lamb that was slain is blessing. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all time. Christian, hear me. Do you bless the Lord at all time? The psalmist continues, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. You know what we do? When we talk about things, we can't go to what the Lord has done. We'll say things like, well, what about the weather? Are you serious? Or what about them stealers? My, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. The psalmist continues, my soul shall take her boast in the Lord. 
The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. And then the psalmist turns around as though to the rest of his congregation and says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Do you bless the Lord continually? Is his praise in your mouth continually? Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What are his benefits? Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who heals all thy diseases. Hebrews says it this way, the closing chapter, by him, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. This Christmas, may it be a thing that we bless the Lord. May we not forget his benefits. He sent his son, born to die, that you and I might live. Lastly, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, Worthy is the land that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I bring it all together with this word. We owe to give him a remembrance. John says the remembrance there recorded for us in Revelation 5, the very next two verses. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea... And all that are in them heard I say, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever. I bring all those things that we saw in verse 5 with that last thing being remembrance. One of the first curses that the early church walked through is that they forgot. In Revelation chapter 2, the Lord says, in order to get back to where you once were, remember. How's your remembrance? Can you think back the day that you're saved? Can you think back of when the Lord gave you some victory of some sort? Can you think back of all those spiritual steps that he's allowed you to take? One of the things that I'm constantly reminded of that I need to thank the Lord. John says in John, the third John, his third epistle, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in the truth. And I remember and I give thanks every day that my children I'm not saying it is bragging. God did it. Are walking in the truth. Christians, don't forget all those many things. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Revelation chapter 3. There's a very sobering verse. And the church there in picture in Revelation chapter 3 is the church of the Laodiceans. The Laodiceans were neither hot or cold. And the Lord says, in a sense, you make me sick. And he spewed them out of his mouth. Listen to what he said as far as to get back right with him. He says, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke. I chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. And then he says it this way. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup to him and he with me. This Christmas, understand that like that church and the Christians of the Church of Laodicea, the Lord is standing at your door and knocking. Now, many apply that to salvation. That's not a salvation verse. That's a verse saying to us as Christians, all I want is to have a relationship with you. He's knocking, dear Christian. 
Are you responding? This Christmas time, may we say together, worthy is that lamb who was slain to receive power and blessings and glory and strength and honor. There used to be a Christmas song that we sang years ago. It went something like this. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what can I give him? Oh, Christian, this is the response. Give him my heart. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, I pray that this Christmas time we would honestly seek first the kingdom of God. This Christmas time, I pray, Heavenly Father, it's the birthday of the King. May we carefully consider what are we going to give the one that is worthy, that was slain for us. And I pray, Father, that as we read through Revelation 5, 12, we would give him all those things listed there, power, glory, honor, but in a real deep essence, Father, I pray that you would allow us to give you our hearts. Thank you for our time together today. And I pray, Father, that this Christmas time, instead of worrying, wondering what we're going to do, wondering what we're going to get, may this Christmas time we be drawn into a closer walk with you, that we would decide to give you our hearts. In Jesus' precious name, amen.